Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, The Big Bang, Battle of Waterloo. Let's get into it. April 1814. For 10 years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, The Big Bang, Battle of Waterloo. Let's get into it. April 1814. For 10 years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. There's a couple of interesting things here that were pointed out in the comments of the last video. One, the fact that they give Napoleon control of Elba is really interesting to me. He has been beating them up and down Europe forever now, right? I mean, he's wiped out entire armies from huge continental European powers. Once they beat him, they don't execute him. They literally give him an island to control. And... He actually does really well with the administrative handling of that island, right? Um, which is one of the things that's kind of overlooked, but he actually does pretty well with the administrative stuff in France. You know, the, the actual governmental duties of a country, um, which is crazy that he's this, you know, brilliant military commander. He's leading armies all around Europe. And also the, the changes, the reforms that were made in France during that time period, it's really wild. Um, also, one of the other things that was pointed out was how weird human nature is. Um, they, the people of France literally overthrew and killed the, the government, the, the monarchy before, right? They killed Louis. They killed Marie Antoinette. Um, they went to war over the idea that the other European countries would somehow come in and put down their revolution, right? I mean, it pushed them to war. And now they are so tired of war, um, they will do anything for peace, so much so that they are openly proclaiming their support for the old monarchy, right? That in and of itself is wild to me. However, when Napoleon goes back, it's not even a full year, if I remember correctly, from his time in Elba. And already the, there are citizens and military members that immediately jump right back on board with Napoleon even with them proclaiming, you know, support for the old monarchy just months before that. It's a really weird, like, humans tend to forget the bad things, the bad times, relatively quickly. Our brains kind of, like, dull that, that trauma, I guess... I guess that's what you could call it. Our brain tends to dull it, and we view things only through the prism of, like, the good times, right? Um, 
And that's very interesting to me that they're so over Napoleon that they actually claim support for the old monarchy. And then immediately after that, forget all of the bad that they were, you know, facing under Napoleon and are like, all right, Napoleon's back. Let's, let's get back to it. It's just a very interesting look at human nature. But rumors soon reached Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers-on, the very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Most of France soon follows suit. But in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach, Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. It's very interesting to me, kind of the, the foresight maybe, um, Napoleon had the opportunity for this peace agreement for a long stretch of time. Even after he was, it, it looked like the, the empire was falling, like he was going to lose his throne. He still had the ability to make this deal with the Allies. It was only after this kind of like breaking point where they were like, no, no more negotiations. We're, we're completely taking you off the throne. Um, but he had the opportunity for this deal. So it's interesting to me that maybe being away, maybe backing away from it and getting a better perspective, he was like, you know what? As long as I have the throne, that's really all I need to kind of get the ball rolling again and have a future for the French. So that's what I'll go for. I'll go for the throne and everything else can be figured out after that. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own, but he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. Blücher is such a madman. The Prussian army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning, at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. There, he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. 
so Wellington decides to stand and fight. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his centre on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillotte. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch and German troops, many of whom have never seen combat before. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. What a, what a huge buildup here, right? The, the French have the victory against the Prussians. They separate the British and Prussian forces. They go after the British. They keep the Prussians moving in retreat. You, you know, Napoleon's just gotten his throne back. He has this big army again. What a huge buildup to this battle at Waterloo. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make movement easier for his troops. But the lost hours will later prove costly. The battle begins around 11 a.m., when Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. He hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them, and the intruders are all killed. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry. The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabres. Scores of Frenchmen are ridden down and two of their famous Eagle standards are captured. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, charge too far. They become scattered, their horses blown. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. That's the most British name I've ever heard in my life. Um, okay, so this is very interesting, this chess match back and forth here. One thing that I'm curious about, why the village wasn't taken by the French beforehand. Um, I feel like that's dangerous to have it be, you know, it's so far up out of the, the British line and so close to the French line that I feel like it's in a dangerous position there. Um, I'm just curious why that wasn't. I mean, I know you don't want to commit more because it's a feint, obviously. If you commit a bunch of troops there, it's no longer a feint. But that seems like tactically something you would want to take before sending troops past it. 
Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares with bayonets fixed. Yikes. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Meanwhile, Blücher's Prussians have begun to arrive. They capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around six. Man, this is dangerous. The, the entire flank of the French army is open right here. This is, a, this is a super dangerous position. That was such a brilliant move by Blücher to have his rear guard fight and then have the rest of the army kind of use that as a shield to get to Waterloo. That, that seemed really smart to me. 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't miss the closely packed formations and casualties quickly mount. It begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, it will be killed where it stands. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. The Prussians are arriving in force, and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. Man, you know it's a desperate situation then, right? He has been so unwilling to put them out into a battle unless it is the most dire of circumstances. So that tells you kind of how backed into a corner he feels here with the Prussian army coming up on his flank. At 7.30 p.m., 3,000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield towards the Allied center. Wow. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers and then retreats. Wow! Wellington, sensing victory, orders a general advance. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plancenoit. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumors of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. Man, that's like an ancient warfare battle. You know, that's the whole thing with ancient warfare is there's relatively few casualties in the actual battle, but it's when one side breaks and runs where the, you know, the advancing side just unleashes a wave of cavalry and they just go start spearing those guys, the, the retreating army in the back. Um, that's wild. That's, that's how big of a difference there is between drilled and disciplined and undisciplined troops is, is wild. But even the most disciplined troops, there can be circumstances where they, they lose their discipline. And I, I always talk about it in the way of like, um, imagine you're in this situation you're in one of the drilled units and you may have the discipline to stay 
and form a defensive square or retreat in good order or whatever it is. But how many others have to literally just get up and start running off the battlefield before then your fear becomes, we will be the last ones left, right? Like we're going to be the only ones still standing here. And then that starts to break your discipline and your unit's discipline. Um, it's a very difficult situation where once once an army starts to break like that, it's very hard to restore order. Um, I've talked about this in another video. Uh, the Greek god Phobos is what they believe ruled the battlefield, right? The Greeks believe that Phobos ruled the battlefield. Why? Phobos was the Greek god of fear. And that was the whole thing, was as long as you you... Fear didn't overtake your army. You could stand and you could at least mount a defense. But when fear took and the retreat started, the, the slaughter began. And so Phobos was who the Greeks thought decided battles. And that's, that's what this looks like here. Maybe not decides it, but like the, the way that the French army just dissolves, it really looks like an ancient battle. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. Man, you can imagine that conversation. Wellington being like, hey man, thanks for uh, showing up when you did. Blücher's like, no man, it's all you. You know, the big advance and everything that broke the army, that's all you. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory, but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. <laughs> the Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near-run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. Man. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time, there was no escape. He died there six years later. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another 100 years, until the summer of 1914. Wow, so the next time the British fight, they have this new, like, relatively short-term agreement, sort of agreement, that, that they'll fight with the French for World War I. But the last major war they were involved in in Europe was against the French. And then they'll have to go, essentially, to the aid of the French in World War One, that's very interesting. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard, Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the Second Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. Man, that was such a good series. Um, and interestingly enough, if you want to see what specifically some of Napoleon's cavalry looks like. Um, you can go look at the World War I French cavalry uh, at the beginning of the war. 
they uh, they were still not up to the modern era of that time. They were still living in the past. The French army was. Um, that was such a good series. I'm going to go straight into the Marshall series next. Um, so I'll have that first video out tomorrow. Like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. And I'll see you guys then.